Okay, so uh, the plan is that we have a couple of topics, uh, I have a couple of topics that um, I'm going to talk about. Um, we have quite some time, so we will talk about some of the things, but you can also think about, you know, own topics that you're interested in or questions, and we will have time to, um, you know, to, to get to those questions as well. So, uh, well, I would like to start uh, talking a little bit about the MOOC, right? So, uh, you very successfully recently did this process mining MOOC, which is, in, for those of you who don't know that, it's an online course where people can watch videos and basically follow a university-level process mining course online. Uh, and there were quite many people participating and enthusiastic about it. So, I'm curious, were there any surprises or any kind of things that you did not expect, um, to, you know, yeah. to get out of that. Yes, so, so, so indeed it was a very interesting adventure. It took a lot of, lot of time to make it. It's more work than you actually think uh, at the beginning. Uh, but it was a big success. And the first surprise was that uh, so many people took it. So uh, the first course, I think in the end, we had 43,000 people registered uh, for the course. Uh, then the second time, which we did very quickly after that, I think it was a... Uh, I think uh, 24 something. Uh, and the nice thing of a MOOC is that you just switch it on again. And again, there will be <laughs> tens of thousands of people taking it. So, so, so there will be another run this after the, the, uh, later this year. And I expect, yeah, again, let's say more than 30,000 people taking that uh, course. So the scalability thing was very uh, uh, surprising uh, for me. If you look at the, uh, because perhaps for the audience it's interesting to see some statistic. Well, if you look around in the room, then uh, I think it matches the statistic. I think 80% is male, 20% uh, is female. Mm -hmm. Typically, it's the age group, I would say, between 25 and 45. Uh, so that also seems to, uh, to hold. If you look in countries, then uh, I think the US has... Uh, I think close to a quarter of all the people that were there uh, were from the US. I think 11% from India. And then there is a large group, around 3 or 4%, that's like uh, the UK, Germany, the Netherlands, uh, Spain, uh, the, 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 the types of Russia was, was very high. Mm -hmm. uh, so, 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 so these were the statistics. If you then look at what was... Uh, uh, surprising. I think there were many things that were unsurprising. So, like the difficulties that people see uh, were more or less ex ex exactly at the places where we expect them. Yeah? So, in theory, it looks very easy, and then you start doing it on your own data set, and then you think that some things that look simple are not that simple. Yeah? Like what is exactly the case ID, etc. And you you would find these these types of things. Uh, there were also surprising. Uh, applications. So there was one very funny, uh, I think it never resulted in any real application, but somebody uh, posed a question whether you could uh, use this to investigate time travel. <laughs> <laughs> but how? And there were actually some responses on that. That, that, that kind of puzzled me. But I, I think it was, uh, it's, it's very nice to do. And it also, it really shows all the positive responses and the groups all around the world show that if people know about this, they get very enthusiastic and get going. Uh, and they are often surprised, I think that many people in the audience have the same experience, that if they see it and they hear about it, then they wonder why they did not see it before. That's kind of a recurring thing that you see coming back. Yeah, I agree. That's what we see too. So the, yeah. this consistent enthusiasm. Once they see it, if it's you know if they are yeah. somehow working with processes, or they typically get enthusiastic. And uh, yeah, so I didn't. They're always like, why don't I know about this, yeah. right? But then, did many people then email you or tell you about applications that they did, or was it mostly taking place in the forum? There was a lot of activity as well. I, I, I would say it's mostly taking uh, place in the forum. As I said, there were also these discussion groups all over the world that did uh, uh, things together. But there were lots of, uh, also from many companies that would then, uh, so where somebody in the company would take this course and then would approach us uh, to see whether we could do something together, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, at some point in time, I'm also getting nuts by, let's say, all the requests that are coming in of people that want to do something where from a university point of view, it is kind of unclear uh, unless 
companies are able to really pay for research, otherwise it's off, off yet. It's that they look for more for consulting, I would say, mm -hmm. than for university research. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, did you get any new ideas for research out of it? It's, or is it more one way than giving out the knowledge? I don't think so. I, I think mm. the, the, the feedback, uh, but, but you have to realize that here at the university I'm teaching two process mining courses. And of course, we have applied this, I don't know, in 150 companies. So the, the, the feedback that you get is quite consistent, I would say. That, uh, yeah. Yeah. And so for, for example, people struggling with the case ID notion yeah, is like uh, uh, something that in the beginning it looks clear for people and then they start doing it. Mm -hmm. And then they realize that, yeah, that is more difficult than what they saw. Okay, thank you. Well, um, one other thing that I also, in a way, noted, also maybe in connection with the MOOC, it's like, um, well, it's positioned in the context of data science, um, but also it's a little bit over the past years, it seems that um, it has a little bit changed also how people react or how people receive process mining in the sense that they are more ready than ever because of certain developments that have taken place. So well, if, if we're really looking completely back towards the beginning, so you started doing research on that um, yeah, more or less 15 years ago, and then yeah, it's just in the past maybe five years or so that it's commercially really uh, used in that sense. So. Do you see any change in perception over those 15 years, or were those, those first people who saw, you know, uh, 15 years ago saw it, were they as enthusiastic as the people who see it today? Yes, I think when we started doing this, I think most people would say that we were nuts, in the sense that uh, as a, so our background is very much in process modeling, uh, business process management, at that time, point in time we called it workflows. Uh, these were the things that we were doing, and many people had a model-driven attitude uh, towards things, not so much a data-driven attitude. So they thought, if we implement a perfect information system, then all the problems are gone. Uh, that, that was there, and it was very strange to try to do process mining, and if you look at our first applications, they were also strange. Uh, so we had applications where people were writing on yellow notes when they were starting and when they were done. Now it looks uh, foolish, but at that point in time, it was the only way to analyze a process because there were, were no logs. And of course, with the explosion of data, you can see that the vision that we had at that point in time uh, uh, can now be realized today. Yes, so, so parts of this vision, I think, are quite consistent and still valid. I think parts of the original vision were also uh, not very smart. Yeah, so we came from a workflow area, and there was this belief that uh, you would mine the processes, and then you would just automate them, and everything would be uh, beautiful. I think today we, we look a bit more realistic towards these types of things. What we see is that uh, many processes, if you really want to have certain types of flexibility, you don't want to automate them. Uh, you just want to analyze the processes and you do not need to automate improvements. There are many other ways uh, to do it. Also, in the beginning, the focus was very much on discovery, discovering processes. Uh, today, I see that it's much more about aligning event data with these process models so that you con continuously can project things on these process models that these process models become like the lens to look at reality. And it's not so much the lens itself, but it's more that you use the lens to, to improve certain things. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we have also matured, not just the, uh, the, the people using it. But, yes. Uh, Yes, certainly there is a lot of been, a lot of research taking place, and and a lot of things have developed. What I noticed on on our end, well, once we started after um, the PhD, going out with Prom, you know, trying to do consulting projects back then, uh, what we were really also doing for I think two or three years was just trying to simplify even more and more and more. I, I had the feeling in the beginning people didn't really understand. I, sh I tried to explain it to them. And then, I, okay, I, even always when I thought you can't simplify it further, you could make it even simpler. And the, yeah, the, the surprising effect was that people were more receptive, that they understood it. So that really helped also yep. in kind of 
yeah, it's of course very very simple then uh, when you show it, and, and there's a lot more research behind it. So that's really good yep. uh, in the MOOC. Um, so, um, well, one one other topic I'm interested in is um, if you are looking at how process mining is defined, right? Is this is this something that you worry about? That it's um, you know, is it is it clear enough what is process mining and what is not process mining? Because sometimes people, you know, include it in their own versions of you know how they define things. How do you see that? Yes, I see. I see that some people uh, are misusing terms. And so that they use their own terms, and when that doesn't work, they use another term, etc., etc. That's of course a, a very a common practice. In my view, process mining is the field that is somehow related to event data on the one hand. And so there are events, discrete events, which refer to activities that have a timestamp and, and the, 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 the things that. If you load things into Disco, these are the first three columns that you need to use. That's event data. So that's one side of the story. I think the other side of the story, it has to be about process models that are somehow related to these event data. And that is the whole area. And uh, I think many people, uh, that, that, that's a broad area. And many people uh, uh, don't see how broad the area is. Uh, because they just look at it at the surface. And so in my view, uh, process discovery is the most exciting thing. From an academic point of view, it's the most challenging thing to do. Uh, but the most valuable thing is that you actually connect these event data to these process models, so that you see where are deviations, where are bottlenecks, and try to understand that in a continuous manner. That's the most important thing. So people that, I don't, I don't know, on the one hand have process models and on the one hand uh, look at uh, aggregate statistics like flow times, that has nothing to do with process mining. Because you're not actually connecting the elements of this process model to the elements of the event log. And so simple dashboards, etc. that is not process mining. But process mining is definitely much more than just process discovery. And so you have not just control flow, although that's what we always see in the pictures. We also have resources, uh, like organizational entities. We have data attributes, as I see that in uh, that, that uh, like if you look at maturity, we, in many more cases, we are not just looking at the control flow, but we are also interested in the characteristics of cases that take a particular path. So we are including the data element. Not just discovery, also conformance checking, bottleneck analysis, and all of, of the, these types of things. And, and I was just talking about that with some people during the break. I think what we also see at this point in time is that process mining is typically used in an offline setting. That has to do with the maturity of the field. I think more and more applications of process mining will go to the online setting. Yeah, so where there is a continuous stream of events, and that you don't want to say something about the last year, you want to say something about that case that is now entering the system and what will happen to it. Yeah, so, so that shows that probably my definition of process mining is broader than the mindset of many people in the audience. Yeah, and, and in that sense, it's a very broad field also, yeah, and enabling all kinds of combinations yep. of techniques uh, also with yep. uh, data mining, data science and all. But even coming back very quickly to that definition, then there should be a model, there should be event data that's connected to the model. What I've seen at least some time ago that some of these process modeling vendors do. They have like a modeled process, manually modeled. They have maybe connected some kind of data source with event data, but they're assuming that that's the process. Yep. So in my view, that's not process mining. What do you think? I, I fully agree. And, and there are, uh, yeah, you, you, you know, some classical examples that we saw in the past of very uh, respected vendors that if you would uh, carefully look at their uh, performance results, they would actually record negative times for waiting times. And that was when things would happen in a different uh, order. Mm -hmm. So these types of things show that, uh, that it's, uh, you should be prepared or willing to see the unexpected. You should be willing to see the deviations. 
you should be willing to look at the truth. Because if you look at these types of things, it's the same as looking at flow times. Of course, you can look at two things, measure the average time behind it, but that's not, not sufficient. And if it's about tool vendors and, and, and these types of things, it's also, uh, also in the scientific area, some people would say uh, process mining is a sub-branch of data mining. Process mining is a sub-branch of machine learning. And in theory, that is, of course, completely true. Yeah, that, 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 that there's nothing against that. If you look at the broad definition of machine learning, the broad definition of data mining, of course, process mining is part of it. But now let's take a look at the techniques and the tools. And you would go to machine learning conferences or you would go to data mining conferences or you, or you would look at these tools. There is nothing there. Yeah. And, that, and, and that's the, the misleading game with definitions, that you choose a definition that is broad, that it includes everything, but it doesn't uh, mean that you provide the, the functionality that we are all using today. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's something one really has to explain to people and that yeah. there's yeah. no overlap and you don't find this in yeah. data mining tools. Yeah. But looking at it from you know the other way around, if you look, look at the um, job profile, basically, the people who are doing that, uh, there is this uh, there is the job profile or position even of a data scientist. Many companies hiring data scientists today. So how do you see that moving forward? Do you think there will be like really a job description that companies are using, uh, you know, looking for uh, process miners or will it always be like, you know, a data scientist, for example, um, with process mining experience as, you know, one of the profile things? Yeah, so, 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 so we are now at a change in time. Yeah, that, that, that's, uh, as I said, so, so Anna knows that, but, but for the audience, I'm here in Eindhoven, the scientific director of the Data Science Center. It's one of the largest data science initiatives in the Netherlands. Uh, together with the University of Tilburg, we are defining a, a bachelor for data scientists. And we expect hundreds of people to, to study it. As of September, there will be uh, uh, two masters in data science that people can take. So you can see that at, uh, on the educational side of things, things are changing dramatically. Uh, you can see that there is an interest and a need for people that have this education. And uh, I'm one of the, perhaps the first professor in computer science in the Netherlands that studied computer science. All the people before me, they studied physics or, or, or something else. Hmm. Uh, what we now see is just as computer science emerged in the early 80s, we now see that data science is emerging. And of course, the profile of a data scientist is a blurry profile. Uh, so we now find it a problem that we do not know exactly what a data scientist is. But do we know today what is exactly a computer scientist? Uh, so if you study computer science here, or you study computer science in Utrecht, uh, it will be completely different. Really? Mm. It will be completely different. <coughs> Let alone when I started studying uh, uh, computer science in the beginning of the 80s. Uh, at that point in time, if you would study computer science in Eindhoven, it would be completely different than if you would do that in another place. Yeah, there was somebody like Dijkstra here that taught it in a particular way that was very different. So we should not be too concerned about, let's say, these variations. It's a, it's a, let's say, a fluid process. But the direction is clear. The direction is uh, towards more data-driven things. So if you are a consultant, things will be more evidence-based. If you are an auditor, things will be more evidence-based. Even if you're, uh, I don't know, a researcher in social sciences, things will be more uh, data-driven. Uh, so all these directions are clear in which way that it will go. Of course, if you look at, role at uh, the, the role at processes, I think it should be an integral uh, part in the in the in the education forms that we define, it will be there, but it will not automatically be the case everywhere, I'm afraid. Yeah, so I think it will take some time uh, uh, for the field to evolve, to really define that this as this is an area that is really different from all the other ones. One of the things, sorry for the long story, uh, uh, one of the dangers that I see of many data science educations also if you look at online courses, is that 
time and time again the same things are being repeated. Yeah, so it's always, I don't know, decision trees, frequent item sets, it's always the same. So if you have a data science curriculum and you define data mining one until data mining five and machine learning one until machine learning five, you just repeat the same things without considering things like uh, processes and, and things that really you need to connect to that data. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. It's maybe a good point in time to open up the discussion a little yeah. bit. So if anyone from the audience wants to join in, has a topic, I see some hands there, so. Um, I, I just wanted to mention that um, there's a PhD student in, in the audience who works at a, at a hospital in the UK and she, she, well, explained an idea about using process mining there. Uh, a process mining shows sort of average treatment paths through a hospital. And one of her ideas was you can use that to predict which department is going to be overloaded uh, in, in, in a certain situation. And you would need fairly real-time application of your, your process model. Perhaps it's something for you to look into as well and perhaps contact her. Yes, yeah, so, 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 so we just finished the book with uh, Ronnie Mans. I think he's sitting there at, uh, uh, on the on the application of process mining in healthcare. Uh, it doesn't include so much, uh, let's say, the resource scenario that that, that you are referring to. It very much uh, uh, refers to, let's say, basic things like discovery, conformance checking, also data quality problems that you typically find in a in a hospital setting. But indeed, I think. Uh, if I look at the uh, research, I think something that is underexplored in general is the resource aspect. Yeah, so the, the control flow aspect is the part that we do first. Uh, but we should be able to better capture the behavior of resources. And resources are typically behaving quite different than what we think. Yeah, so there is a certain flexibility that people can deal with bigger load workloads for a, for a particular period. Uh, and it would be very nice to, to have better mining techniques to capture these types of things. Uh, but but uh, uh, we already do many things uh, related to prediction. And if you do prediction, you should uh, model the resources in a, in a very good way to be able to anticipate where the bottlenecks will be tomorrow. But, uh, uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to add that uh, having your uh, resource uh, loads in, in a network adds value uh, as opposed to analyzing resources on their own because you don't know where their load is going from. It's, uh, sorry, it's coming from. Yeah. If you know a network with an entry point, then you can f yeah. more or less predict where the load is going to be. Yeah, so, 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 so one of the difficulties of resources is that they are typically involved in multiple processes. So we have seen applications where uh, the bottleneck in the process would be a person that would spend only half an hour per week on the process. But he would be the source of the biggest delay. So that sees that, that you need to, uh, to look at these things very carefully. And you cannot simply apply operations research type of techniques. You need to, to have somehow smarter models that take into account this background. Uh, work. Yeah. Maybe just a quick uh, note also to add to that uh, there are sometimes really also interdependencies between processes, right, that are quite interesting yeah. and that can be influenced and a good example that I've seen there is that at the um, at the tax office in the Netherlands, they have looked at their, you know, the process where people, you know, when basically they send out the statements, but then um, people can complain in a time frame of six weeks or something. So what happens if you send everyone in the country like at the same time you know, those things, then you will get a lot of um, complaints in your complaint process. So they're not, inde they're not independent, they're interrelated. So you can influence, like if you, you know, send it in pieces, you can influence how much workload you get back to better manage the, the resources that you have. So yep. that's another example, but it's a very good point, I agree. Yep. Um, thank you. Um, the whole question of definitions I particularly find unhelpful because I, things are very fluid. I was wondering whether you would comment on something you alluded to, which is the coming 
use of real-time online process modeling and event data. Those are techniques that are pretty well advanced in other areas of data science. It seems like there's a real opportunity to use these techniques that are being used by businesses, online businesses all the time now, using tools that are available to look at things in real time, not post-fact. How do you see that merging? What, what's, going, what, what's it going to take? Is it going to be tools? Is it going to be a mindset? Because the process mining community still is looking back post-fact, or at least what I know. Uh, um, I think that, that uh, kind of if you look at the research side, there's probably much more than you are aware of. So for example, I think I had, uh, I don't know, five master projects on uh, predicting the remaining flow time in processes going back 15 years ago or, or something like that. Also today we are doing a lot of work in, let's say, streaming, process mining and, and, and the, the, these types of things. I think if you look at the process as a whole, probably it is an unfair comparison in terms of complexity to compare, uh, let's say, the analysis of a, of a process which is spaghetti-like, which has all kinds of dynamics, with analyzing a single decision in some process. Uh, I don't know, do customers that like this thing also like this thing? Uh, that, that, that you can use the same types of techniques, but it's slightly more uh, complicated. I think that's one reason that we do not see that much of it, because it's simply more complicated. I think another reason is that uh, these kind of uh, real-time things, these online things, also require a tight integration with the real information systems. Yeah, so the techniques are there, but I think that uh, existing vendors do not yet have the, uh, uh, let's say, the tool support to actually integrate this in the running system itself. Yeah, that, 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 that's like, it, it's the same, uh, I've been trying, uh, uh, as I've, I've developed many workflow engines, and what you typically see, it is very easy to get a modeling tool accepted, it is very difficult to get a workflow engine running in a, in a commercial setting, etc., etc. I think that this is a bit the case, but it is more complicated, and many of the things that you can see in the area of, I don't know, concept drift in, in data mining, predictive analytics, are actually already in the process mining field, but I think it's just a bit too early still. I want to ask a quick follow-up question on that yeah. point, because is it not also in some way related to that um, if you have some kind of uh, you know prediction, something kind of a monitoring thing, it's always some going to something specific. It's domain specific. It's process specific. It's something that's the key metric that you want to monitor for that process where you want to get emails and alerts. You don't want to get that for everything. So it's something that you. If you have a prediction mechanism in data mining, you would train the model, you would build it to give the great results yeah. that you want, and then you run that. With process mining, we are having, we are most, for the most part, building generic tools where you can look at any process without having to figure these out before. And then you can build on that knowledge to build a kind of domain specific yeah. solution. So that it's really complementary, but. Uh, yeah. so, so, so we have been looking in, uh, for, for example, in, in the in the notion of concept drift. So you're monitoring a process for a longer period of time. And when do you now say the process has changed? And what has changed? And if you look at uh, like simple data, like what is the percentage of rejections, and you can see it is always, I don't know, you reject 80% and accept 20%, and you see it changes to something else, and you can say, okay, now it has changed. And that's relatively easy. But if you look at the process with concurrency and all of these types of things, the process itself is already incredible dynamic. And then if you would like to know when is something changing, that's a question that is suddenly much more difficult than if you look at a single number or a single value. As I say, I think I agree with you. Uh, yeah, let me I just. I was just going to follow up. I, I really wanted to be more positive. Came across a little bit too negative. I I think I'm waiting to find out when the tools are going to be available that I use elsewhere in my life 
as a data scientist that allows me to actually look at real-time feeds because I think that there's a real potential to define compliance more broadly. You're doing an experiment, you want to see how things change. You want to see how the process changes. You want to be able to do this in real time. Yeah, a question about uh, basically process mining at scale. So we're talking about real time. The other part would be very large data set, so the big data area basically. What's your view on this and actually paralyzing uh, the process mining? Yeah, that has been my personal hobby over the last couple of years. Uh, uh, so if you look at, uh, uh, as of the first, I think process mining tools and techniques are typically already incredible fast. Uh, so, so if you look at the disco, uh, I think it's, uh, if you compare that to many other tools and you can see what you get, I think it's incredibly fast. Also, if you compare it to, I don't know, association rule analysis and stuff like that, process mining is incredibly scalable. So, so that's the current status. Now, if you would look at the uh, uh, even larger data sets, so we are looking at things uh, like decomposing uh, uh, process mining problems. So if you do conformance checking, it is trivial to get a linear speed up. So if you have 10 times as many computers, it will be 10 times as fast. It's trivial. Also, if you look at uh, discovery, and you look at what these discovery techniques do, they are typically counting things. Eh? So anything related to MapReduce and Hadoop you can do. Yeah, so also in our group we are doing research in this area where we do these things on, on top of Hadoop, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think uh, things are already fast and many of the basic things you can scale uh, incredibly. At the same time, but these are not the types of things that you look at when you uh, use something like, like Disco, at the same time, there are certain problems which are uh, incredibly difficult. Yeah, that, that like, uh, for some of the more advanced process mining techniques, you're constantly solving optimization problems. Sometimes for every event in the log, you need to solve an optimization problem. Uh, so we're also doing research in that area, but there there are, let's say, limits to what you can do. Yeah, that, that. Uh, so there, I, I, in the future, I would be interested in doing more, as so for these more advanced types of analysis, to also do uh, approximative things. So you just say, I have now one minute. Give me the best compliance value that you can get me in one minute. Any more topics from the audience? Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. And you don't know what an honor it is to be talking to the guru of process mining. Oh, thank you. And um, I'm the PhD student he was talking about. <laughs> and I'm the one who has been um, making both of you crazy with my emails. So you can finally put a face to it. <laughs> so um, um, following up just uh, on the question that he was asking on my behalf, that I'm interested in putting it in real time, especially because um, you know how complex things are in healthcare. I mean, it's just driving me insane. In these past two years, I've been doing the research. I mean, I've probably aged 20 years just because of the healthcare complexity. So um, what I'm trying to do right now is I'm working on prostate cancer. And I'm trying to um, see the conformance of the national guidelines with what we found, um, the de facto model. So this is the problem which I'm finding, that the national guidelines, the expert opinions, how do I convert them into a model that can be compared to the de facto model which I found from the event logs? It's just too complex, so I'm not finding a way to do that. Is, are Petri nets the way to go, or should I be using something else? So it depends where the problem is. So, 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 so there are two types of problems if you look at these types of things, and it's not just the healthcare. It's also if you are in the uh, ISO area, or if you go to municipalities like reference models, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there may be two types of problems. One problem may be that uh, these things, the, 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 these kind of guidelines are talking about things that you cannot actually connect to event data. Yeah, so if it's a problem like that, yeah, that you cannot connect it to event data, then it doesn't matter whether you are using Petri nets or whatever. Uh, that connection has to be there. 
And so then I would more reverse the process and look at these guidelines and go back to people uh, that these are these guidelines, but they are uncheckable. They refer to things that I can never find the evidence for in reality. Yes, so that's one side of the story. The other side of the story, I think, is that uh, 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 that you could look at the no notation. So I think that in terms of uh, like using Petrinets, you can express anything that you would like, but it may be a bit too complicated. So uh, in, in, in the PSD work of uh, uh, one of our PSDs, we kind of made a taxonomy of all the different types of rules that you could think of. Rules related to control flow, rules related to time, rules related to data, rules related to resources, like the 4i principle and these types of things. So we made a, a collection of, uh, of typical patterns, typical rules that you would like to check. And then the idea is that people formulate these rules, let's say in natural language, and this natural language is then translated into a Petrinet. You cannot do that in general, but only for this set of rules. And then uh, you do a conformance check in the background. Uh, but, but you have to think, is the problem in the modeling, or is the problem in the fact that these guidelines or reference models are not actually connectable to, to what is happening? So, so in your case, where would you say is the biggest problem in the translation of the rules or the fact that these rules cannot really be connected to uh, both i think it's both uh, 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 uh. yeah it's healthcare what do you expect uh, so so with <laughs> with, with the rule part we can help with the other part uh, you have yeah. to do it yourself yeah. thank you uh, are you available for an autograph later on <laughs> i'm afraid so yeah. we had one more question in the front in any case but Maybe there are more. We have time for one, two more, I think. So, Willy, you wanted him. Yeah. You made a remark about struggle, struggles with the case, and I wondered if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, that, that's uh, uh, for me. That has been uh, uh, kind of over the years one of the most surprising things. If people draw process models, BPMN, UML activity diagrams, EPC diagrams flowchart, you name it, eh, boxes and arrows. People draw boxes and arrows and they don't realize that they are already implicitly using a case notion. Eh, so if you have a box and arrow, then you say, now this is activity is happening for this patient, for this uh, <laughs> building permit, whatever. Uh, so people don't realize it when they do it. And sometimes they are connecting boxes with arrows to each other that are somehow not really related. Yeah, so for example, if you look at the SAP reference model, that, that's one of the examples that they often use. If you look at the SAP reference model, they are connecting activities related to an application of a person to activities that refer to the position itself. And if you look at it superficially, you don't see it. Another example, Suppose that you are handling, uh, that, that you're processing orders. So somebody places an order. The order consists of multiple order lines. There are deliveries. People are again making boxes, arrows. They talk about things that relate to an order. Things that relate, uh, so if you check the availability, that is for an order line, not for the order as a whole. Then there is a delivery, and the delivery may correspond to several orders, or part of an order, etc., etc. And so there are zillions of such examples. People draw boxes and arrows, and somehow they, they don't see it. Then you look at the data, and then you suddenly realize that you have to be more precise. Because now you have all these events, and these events need to be correlated. You need to know what belongs to each other. And then if you would look in a hospital setting, then you would see it's very easy because you just look at uh, the column with the patient ID and the case ID is clear and correlation, uh, relating events, automatically happens. But now you look at these seemingly structured environments like handling customer orders and suddenly you see that if you look at these, the, the, the actual data, 
you have one too many or many too many relationships. And then suddenly you need to have a much more precise definition of what the process is. Uh, and that's, I think, uh, uh, yeah, something that people often underestimate, that they are making many mental errors when they are using, when they are making PowerPoints, that they are connecting things that really should not be connected. And then they look at the data and suddenly they are overwhelmed by the complexity. And the way that I view it is that there is this real world with many to many relationships, etc., etc. And if you uh, think of a process, the process is just a view. It's like the, uh, the lens to look at that data. So it is not a single process model that you should be looking at. You should have multiple case notions, and each of these case notions will give you a view on that reality. Uh, so, for example, uh, we look now at the filling of a position in our company, or we now look at handling an application. But we need to be clear, what is it that we are now talking about? And you have these multiple views on that same data set. Does that help? Then, the, you, then the, the, the data that, that you have is probably very much correlated already. That, that you have a, a clear process, you know where it starts, where it ends, and where... And, but but for, for instance, we are now, uh, let's say, talking with Van der Lande. Yeah, so they built, for example, I don't know, handling suitcases at airports and stuff like that. Now think of their warehouses. So all the objects in a warehouse are being tracked. So you know where something is. But now on the, on the input side of the warehouse, uh, a supplier sends a large uh, set of items. And so that's, it, for example, in one container. That container has one ID. Now you open that container, and suddenly all these things have an own ID. Then they are put on the shelves in the warehouse, and then they uh, uh, they start picking an order for a particular supermarket. And these days, when they do the order picking for a supermarket, they are already anticipating what that supermarket looks like, what they should put together. So you see that, uh, that the ID is shifting. Yeah? So you have the supplier side ID, you have the, the, the supermarket side, and you have the warehouse side. And you need to connect it to each other. That, uh, it's, it's a very good point. Actually, yeah. as you didn't see that, but Mika Jans was giving a okay. talk today, yeah. and she that was the point she was making, that people have to think through the consequences, and depending on how they decide to look at it, they will get different results, different views on the data based on how it's created. Yeah. So even if you see the data, you may not realize how many, in how many different ways yeah. you, can, you can look at it. I think we have time for one last question, please, please. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for the MOOC, because yeah, I attempted, I think, first session that was like changing my life, almost. Huh. So thank you. I hope for the good. <laughs> yeah, I hope so as well. <laughs> so that's why I'm here today. Uh, I also recently interested in uh, semantic technologies, and I think <clears throat> the data is one thing, but the meaning of the data oh. is uh, uh, <clears throat> other thing. <laughs> And uh, mining the data, even mining the processes, right? We are facing very often like different understanding of some concepts that are actually similar. So <clears throat> I'm interested if, if you are planning or you did already some research on combining the process mining with kind of semantic uh, technologies, uh, with inference, um, uh, inferring some abstractions level for concepts to see uh, the process from more general perspective. So my, uh, my first PhD on process mining, Anna Carla, you, you, you know her, uh, she, she in fact worked on this topic. So uh, there is a, a predecessor of the XS standard, is MXML, and there is something that is called semantically annotated MXML. Uh, and in that event log, sorry it's technical for, for some, but in that event log you have references to an ontology. So whenever you have a, a, a concept in your event log, it is referring to an ontology in such a way that the uh, meaning is clear. Uh, 
the technology part there, I think, is clear. What is less clear is how organizations will have the discipline to actually create such an ontology, and whenever they are recording things, will be referred to that. And I think there, there, there is the difficulty. Perhaps one way to, to really stimulate these types of things is that uh, could we make uh, process mining domain specific? So what I mean is that uh, there is this ugly reality with relational databases and, and unnormalized tables and, and date problems and whatever. And then there could be for a domain a kind of ontology. This is the type of information that we would like to have. And then define that, then do the extraction from this ugly world into that structure. And then think of process mining techniques uh, that in the background are, of course, using generic technology, but immediately also provide answers in terms of uh, the ontology that you had in the beginning. So then in your answers, not talk about uh, resource and case and these types of things, but make the answers then also that. But also in the scenario that I just sketched, I, I think uh, things like that will happen in the future. They need to happen in the future. Uh, but it will take some time, I think. I, th I think it's the same mistake that some workflow vendors made, that they thought, well, we have this super generic uh, technology that can solve everything, that end users would no longer recognize their own problems in the generic technology that was there. Some more domain-specific yeah. solutions. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, th I would think that the time is up. We don't want to use more of your time. Thanks so much for making the time to come here today. So let's, let's all thank Will. So, and again, thanks a lot to Anne and Christian for again uh, organizing a wonderful event. I think uh, it is great. <laughs>